John Jones, you know, I can assure you guys, I read all of your comments. I can assure you guys, I'm not doing what we call in the business a face turn and all of a sudden being nice to John Jones. I can assure you of that. But there are things about John Jones that I do find to be very fascinating, right? There's a fine line of genius and insanity. We've heard that term. And John would sit on the side of genius, but his mind doesn't operate like ours. That's what's so interesting about it. I mean, some of the records that John's chasing, he shouldn't be chasing. In my opinion, who am I to say? I haven't been cloaked with this kind of success. I only wanted to be this kind of successful. Here, look, guys, let's get ready to fight John. In a big deal when they used to have title fight, main event pay-per-views, they used to do what's called a conference call. Maybe they still do them. I haven't heard of them doing it in a meaningful period of time. But the media, if you qualify, can get on a number. Dana will be on. Both athletes will be on. You'll go back and forth with the questions. Just be over the phone. You're doing your boxer shorts. But John was talking about at that time how important to him it was that he beat me. And it didn't have anything to do with all the reasons we were there. The things I said about him or the ultimate fighter or how this, that, or the other thing went. He wanted to be the greatest light heavyweight of all time. And to do that, he must have more wins by a factor of one. This is him talking. Than Tito Ortiz had. In fact, John, on that phone call, proclaimed Tito Ortiz the greatest light heavyweight of all time in front of himself for the reason that Tito had more fights and victories. And I think they were even titled defenses. I can't quite remember what criteria John applied to it, but John said it very matter of fact. He said it like that's what all of us were thinking. Well, you know, of course, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as good as Tito. And, you know, Tito's got uh, seven wins and I've got four. And I like to make that five when I get one over Chael and get uh, a little closer to Tito's record. And uh, yeah, but he was saying it like this. And we're all sitting back going, huh? What? But he believed it, and it drove him, and it motivated him. And he really wanted to go out and do it, and not for nothing, in some ways it humbled him, which no man fisticuffs was going to be able to do. It was, it was a very interesting look. It's a very interesting look into the mind of John Jones. John does not come out and get himself credit in all of the places I feel he should. I don't know what's going on with John and Stipe. I don't know. I do know if they don't fight in November, they're not fighting. That's not going to be revisited for another day. I do know that. And I know that it has been floated to John, would you fight Pavlich? And the answer was yes. And I, I tell you that because I think John should get credit for that. I mean, in this sport, that's a big deal. In this sport, what you're mentally prepared and willing to do, what you will agree to that somebody else won't agree to, will get you credit. There's a story that John is going to fight Stipe and then right off into the sunset, just for example. And... Not only is that not in John's mind, if John doesn't fight Stipe at all, he is prepared to fight whoever's next, which would be a representation of the next era. Whoever's going to grab the torch and run with it when he's done, they're there now. It's not some 14-year-old in Cuba that we're waiting to get signed to the organization. They're there now. It might be Aspinall. might be Pavlich. might be... Aspinall's next opponent, Merson, I can never say his name. Total stud. I'm sharing with you, they're there now. And if John is willing to go in and face them, which the media is saying he's not, I don't agree with that. The media shouldn't be saying that. People are now saying that John Jones did well in pay-per-view. That's not something that you could say before. If that rumor is true, did you guys see this? It said in the last 12 months that John's return did higher pay-per-views than anything else had done in, in 12 months. You're not going to convince me that John versus Surreal is what did that. That is the day old story that we established in 1993. You take a national champion wrestler against a guy who's never had a wrestling match.
everyone knew who was going to win. That's a little bit revisionist history by me. I, I'm attempting to make a point, which is simply, people want to see John. It wasn't John versus Surreal. It wasn't John ver and fill in the blank. People wanted to see John. Now, that's the simple law of supply and demand. Can that happen two times? I don't know. I, I think so. I think so, based on the fact that I don't believe they want to see the, the champion wrestler against the kickboxer that was one and one in his last two. I don't think that. Whereas you bring in the fireman, got records within the division, or you bring in the Russian, who's knocked out six of the last six inside of the first round. I just think there's something more there. I think that John is in a very interesting spot. And I think that John should be proud of it. I think that he should enjoy it, but I also think that he should get credit for it. I don't think that he should be living in the same time that he was on the conference call when he talks about how many wins he has to have so that he can surpass Tito Ortiz's greatness. I think the fact that it's been floated to John, what are you going to say if we can't make this happen at the Garden? What are you going to say if you get a call and it's going to be Sergi? What are you going to say? Are we even wasting our time going in this direction? I think you're going to retire when you get done fighting Stipe should you win. So if I can't get you Stipe, based on that logic, should we just call it right now? John said, hell no, we shouldn't call it right now. Sergi Pavlich is just fine. I'd rather have Stipe. You're right. You can't give me Stipe, get whoever's next. You say it's Pavlich, then it's Pavlich. I think he should get credit for that. I think that that should be known. I think that's a very interesting thing. I think there's a few very interesting things going on right now. The fight that I'm most excited to see is Conor McGregor versus Usada, and it's getting closer by the day. But when I look at Madison Square Garden, and I know how big that is when I know that International Fight Week is in July, when I'm armed with the fact that Adesanya wants back in there, when we're in a position where Islam has been so dominant, we're not even going to get him opponent. We're going to wait and hold a fight between two guys that clearly don't want to fight each other, but eventually they're going to fight just to draw to him. We're in a very different time. Well, we're in an extremely different time. Aljo gets out of the ring on Saturday, and we're told that we're going to turn him around in 90 days to bring him back to Boston. Now, that has not been done for any fighter in the UFC, possibly in history. The only time we've gone to a press conference to announce when the champion will be defending is when we're going to rematch the champion against the guy that he just fought. This is off the top of Chael's head. This was a different circumstance in that we had the number one contender and we had him present in Sugar Sean. So it was a different circumstance. So perhaps it would make for a different announcement. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think he's getting turned around in 90 days. I don't think just because Sean was there, it was matter. What if Henry won the fight? One judge said that he did. Did it matter? Not make a bit of difference? We all came to the conclusion that we're going to do Boston with Sterling because he's an East Coast guy. We tried to say the fight in New Jersey is fighting his backyard. And maybe that's how they do it out there. I mean, I got to tell you, in the West Coast, that's not how we do it. If you're from Oregon, you go fight in Washington. You're not in your backyard. If we go over to California or even Nevada, they all touch us. You're not in your backyard. I'm not disputing this. I'm just sharing with you. I don't think it was slated. And I don't think if Henry could have got his hand raised like one judge said he should have, that it was going to be Henry versus Sean. I don't think that anybody's getting turned around in 90 days, and I don't think that they're fighting in Boston. I'm sharing with you my opinion. Nothing is done until it's done. There's a whole bunch of moving parts. A whole bunch of things have to come together. The point that I'm attempting to prove or show to you guys is we're in a very different time. Sport really hasn't been done quite like this. I mean, go get a calendar out. It's as simple as that. Go get a calendar out. There's one pay-per-view per month. Broad stroke term by me. We got Stipe versus Jones coming up. We got International Fight Week, and we got the return of Aljo. We got McGregor versus Chandler. We got Islam sitting in a batter's box waiting for two guys that don't want to fight each other to draw into him. Where do you see an open month? 
There's five matches off the top of my head. I haven't even I haven't even consulted Sherdog at this point. I'm just rallying to you off the top of my head. I mean, of these massive fights that you're looking forward to, who do you think's the co-main event? Because there's not enough main event spots to put them. If you don't think there's any fire to the smoke that I'm telling you is John Jones versus Cersei Pavlich, and I'm telling you it's going to be the end of August. If you don't think that there's smoke to that, then tell me who's next for Sergi. And get your calendar out and show me where it's going to be a main event. Or admit to me that the guy six for six inside of five isn't going to a main event, that he's still a curtain jerker. Like, all of these things can't be true at the same time. And there's not a conspiracy here, by the way. There's just a couple of guys, and between all of them, one of them doesn't want to fight. I mean, we've seen it between Benny and Charles. I, I don't know how many times these guys got to blink. Before we get the hint, they don't want to fight. I'm just bringing you just one example. The talk of Jones and the talk of retirement, or he's going to get rid of this era, man. I, yeah, that's not accurate. And that's interesting. That's interesting because it, it would seem that it would be. You can see where a guy has accomplished everything. There's nothing left. There's no challenges. But there's a fine line in genius and insanity. And you're dealing with perhaps the most successful guy of all time. I, I, I can't remember the time that I cheered for John Jones. But if John was walking out, let's just hypothetical. John is walking out. He's walking to the ring. And if he wins whatever hypothetical fight this is, he will then become the oldest champion in UFC history. So he'll, he'll have bookended it. He will have been the youngest champion in history, and he'll have been the oldest. I got to cheer for him. Simple as that. Not only do I got to cheer for him, whoever comes to take this youngest business, whoever gets that opportunity and gets it before he got, I got to cheer against them. I want him to hold on to it. Are you ready for that? I got the guy to beat John Jones. Matter of fact, I got the guy to beat John Jones. His name's Earl Engel, Westland, Oregon. You can look him up. The problem is he's 17, and if I'm wrong, he's 18. And I brought him up to the UFC, and they asked me, when will he be ready? I said, at 25 years old, he needs seven years. And they laughed at me. I got laughed at. I said, I'm not attempting to be funny right now. Whoever is going to beat John Jones is going to have to push him to that end of the spectrum. We've seen guys in there at 45 years old, 44 years old, 47 years old. It would make John 42 years old, but that we're going to have to push him to that end of the spectrum. I listened to Jay Glazer as many years ago on Fox. He gave an entire speech on the guy that's going to beat John Jones. Give this entire diatribe. And it was Jay Glazer was explaining to the audience that the guy that's going to beat John Jones is 12 years old right now. He's in the sixth grade somewhere. But that's a true story. I have the guy that can beat John Jones. Before you can beat John Jones, you have to have a certain DNA. Earl Engel's got the DNA. I didn't even present him with this idea. It's going to be seven years. He wants to go to college. He wants to go and play football. It's, it's this whole thing, but I'm just sharing for you. The things that John finds interesting about his career are not necessarily the same things that we find interesting about his career. And the idea that John would like to fight Steve because he's the most known guy, but is willing to fight surgery because somebody told him that's who's next. Like John or don't like John, he deserves credit for that. 